weren't going to provide much more funding. You know, we knew that the vaccine and therapeutics would be commercialized, and so that work has already started. So um, I feel okay with this. We're certainly not you know, in the situation before you have to ramp it down um, in some way. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that it's going to happen kind of this way as opposed to, you know, by force, you know, abruptly. Is there anything in particular that you're doing as the head of the public health uh, delivery system here in this state uh, relative to this uh, ramping down? You know, uh, right now we're, we're making sure that we understand what the implications are, and that's going to take a couple of months. Um, we ramped down on our side considerably just under a year ago when the state declaration and that's when a lot of our purchasing ability uh, went down. We, we, we sunsetted a lot of the total contracts. So, you know, the, the vaccine front teams that we had going out to various locations, all that ran down when the state emergency ran down about 10 or 11 months ago. Um, so there hasn't been a big action on our part yet. We're still working with the FDA and the CDC to make sure that we fully understand what the implications are. I think we do. And then we'll start, you know, we'll spend February and March working on educating folks on what changes are. The changes are not going to be drastic. And there still will be access to free testing, just not in the same way it is now. But we'll make sure we understand fully before we can go to the public with that. One of the concerns that you and I had talked about before was to be um, around the issue of the cost of the vaccine uh, that have to become commercially available. Have there been any uh, discussions with the pharmacy benefit managers, PMs, manufacturers as to where we're going? I, I noticed that the FDA the other day is uh, kind of uh, working with the manufacturers of the vaccine to get to, like, I don't know how to put it, but updating all of the COVID vaccines to, like, some mixture or some yeah. whatever they call it, to standardize this, and it's, I guess, in anticipation of what's about to happen. Yeah, it's an interesting issue. So, you know, the people that... Um, our, our clients, pharmacy uh, benefit managers, or you know, people that deal with insurance, our expectation is that there's not going to be any disruption in their access to vaccines. You know, the vast majority of insurance policies guarantee uh, low or no cost vaccines for any vaccine that's recommended by the CDC and is on their recommended schedule, which uh, by this point, the COVID vaccines and the boosters are. So people that have Medicaid, Medicaid or, or, or vast majority of private insurance, uh, we don't anticipate any any added barrier to them getting vaccinated or to get boosted. The challenge is going to be for people that are um, underinsured or completely uninsured. And that's going to be a little bit compounded because, you know, once April 1st hits, the state is then going to be obligated to go through the Medicaid role renew people's application, re-verify their eligibility, and there are going to be some people that get moved off the Medicaid program as a result of that. That's the federal mandate that the state's going to undertake. So we are worried about those people. Um, don't have any names yet. There's been a lot of good conversations with the federal administration on this. It's top of mind for them. I mean, there's a lot of uninsured people in the country, and, and it's top of mind for them. I'm confident that they're going to come through some solution. There still is a lot of vaccines that the federal government pre-purchased in Pfizer and Moderna that we haven't used yet, um, that they still have um, some type of ownership over. So we're hoping that can be put towards these folks. But in the state of Louisiana, with Medicaid expansion, it really is going to be a, a small minority of people that fall in that bucket. The most, most people are going to have just as much access to the vaccine through their insurance as they did otherwise. What the FDA said, though, um, their meeting last week, which I'm, I'm very encouraged by, is uh, they're going to be encouraging the pharmaceutical manufacturers to move to an annual COVID booster. Um, there's going to be studies ongoing to ensure the data is there. We expect that it will be, but it's in the name of simplifying the, the, the vaccine and booster program. It's very confusing right now. 
Um, <laughs> for me, even for me, it's right now. But it's confusing to understand. Well, if it's confusing to you, we're off like Trump. That's right. I'll tell you, um, you know, pharmacies have to have six or seven different types of the vaccine and booster, all the vials, different based on what age you are, if you're a booster or initial shot, and so forth. So all of that, right, is simplified. That's what the FDA is hoping to do. I think moving to a dual COVID booster that, much like the flu vaccine, is formulated every year to match what the expected circulating variable.